And Mr. Secretary, why didn't you just quit and walk away? Because I knew that we had followed the law and we had followed the Constitution. And I think sometimes moments require you to stand up and, and just take the shots when you're doing your job. And that's all we did. You know, we just followed the law and we followed the Constitution. And at the end of the day, President Trump came up short. That was Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger on why he resisted the intense pressure we've been talking about that he felt and that was applied by the ex-president and his allies to manufacture evidence of election fraud, of which, of course, there was never any. Raffensperger was one of many state-level officials, most of them Republicans, many of them Republicans, in Georgia and across the battleground states who faced the wrath of Donald Trump and his allies as they sought to overturn the election through the courts, through state legislatures, and when all else failed, through the violent insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Joining us now, someone who was on the receiving end of smears and attacks, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Neil and Caddy are still here. Uh, Madam Secretary, I want to show something that you said about what it was, this was like for you, because we're focusing on Raffensperger, but from the Trump side, this was a national effort. Even the president himself had called on me to be arrested and tried for treason, potentially executed. To hear that the president of the United States, when he loses the election in Michigan, mm -hmm. decides that the way to deal with that is to accuse you of treason, to, to, to ask, to, isn't there some way to arrest her? We should stop expecting that there is a bottom to the lengths that people will go to overturn legitimate election results and seize power in our country. So, Madam Secretary, I seized on that for a couple of reasons. One, you endured um, a particularly brutal pressure campaign and, and threats outside your home and to your, your young family. Um, but it also was directed by Trump. And I'm not ever clear on why he wasn't investigated aggressively after all this became known. He was tweeting his attacks against you, accusing you of treason for not overturning the results in Michigan. Um, he was caught on tape threatening Raffensperger if he didn't find 11,740 or whatever it was votes in Georgia. What do you make of the fact that we're back at the, at the sort of eve of another prosecutor who looked into the conduct, and we don't know whether it'll go all the way up to Trump? Well, look, I think the truth is the truth and the facts are the facts. And, and what you're seeing now is the more people look, as this grand jury has, at actually the truth and the evidence, they'll find first and foremost that the election was fair, legitimate, and the results an accurate reflection of the will of the people. And now moving forward, we need consequences for everyone. I mean, yes, there was one former president involved, but there were a lot of people involved in this effort that aided and abetted the cause. And so what I'm looking for are consequences up and down uh, from people who have lied in court uh, to people whose lies and misrepresentations of what happened in 2020 have led to real threats and consequences in our lives, as your last segment detailed for election workers all around the country. We need to ensure there are consequences at the state and federal and local level for these challenges and attempts to overturn democracy and know that if there are not, it will not end. And as we look into the barrel of a 2024 election cycle, now is the time where those consequences must uh, be pursued. Uh, the law is clear. The Constitution is clear, as my colleague in, in Georgia said. And now we need to see the law enforced and consequences realized, or else we're going to keep facing these challenges again and again, and people are going to get hurt. Madam Secretary, what is the consequence of the Republicans' ability to memory hole the fact that the very same election they agree with Trump was rigged and stolen from him was the very same ballot that sent them back to Congress? Yeah, it's a it's quite a uh, quite an irony, and really speaks to the reality of these you know falsehoods that they're actually even if you just unpack a little bit of them as you just did, they really don't hold up. You can't challenge an entire election for you know allegedly being somehow wrong or or having problems, but only really have problems with one particular candidate in the ballot. Uh, so there there it varies no matter how you look at it. There's no legitimacy to the arguments that the 2020 election results from members of Congress to the Senate to the presidency were anything other than an accurate reflection of the will of the people. And it's time for people to start 
start acknowledging that, and it's time for the courts to start holding accountable those who have not only not acknowledged that, but have not acknowledged it to dire consequences for the people of our elections. One of the things we know that Fannie Willis scrutinized was a fake electors plot. That was, they sought to carry that out in Michigan as well. We don't talk about that as much because it's pretty opaque to us in terms of where the investigations into those individuals and then the, the plot as a national effort stand. But just remind us what that looked like in Michigan. Yeah, I think it's important to see that there were, you know, people lined up to serve as what we call fake electors to then be presented to Congress to be accepted as the electoral representatives of the electoral vote of those states that actually don't represent the uh, electoral vote or the vote that was that happened in Michigan and in many other states. But it was the action, it was sort of the, the tail end of a multifaceted effort to overturn the election results, particularly in battleground states that the former president lost. And so it began with blocking the certification of our elections at the local or state level. Those attempts were then intended to lead for the ability of a false slate of electors to be presented or adopted by state legislators and then presented to Congress and potentially accepted into the record by then Vice President Mike Pence. So it was a clear strategy that, frankly, we saw as it unfolded and we knew was the plan. And that's why, for us at the local level, ensuring that our elections were certified first and foremost, then ensuring that our state legislature certified and, or, or protected or didn't overturn those election results, then ensuring that the actual slate of electors made its way to Washington. All of that was our effort to defend against these nefarious efforts at every step of the way to enable Congress to potentially overturn a presidential election, which would, again, the end result that the false slate of electors were trying to enable. So, Neil, that scheme couldn't exist without Pence doing what Trump told us at speeches in Georgia ahead of the special election there, what he told us on Twitter, and what we know through testimony. He described even more colorfully with one of his favorite swear words on the phone with Mike Pence. Trump sits atop the fake elector plot because he was the one screaming from the rooftops at people to do it. He was calling people at the state level. I think it was the peak of COVID. He was inviting them to the White House, if I remember some of the contemporaneous reporting. Um, I know Jack Smith is, is, is humming along now, but do you think we'll ever understand the delay in examining Trump's role as the architect of the fake electors plot? If you mean the delay by the Justice Department, no. I think it's um, incomprehensible to me that it's taken so long. You know, I know we'll talk about this soon, but like subpoenaing Mark Meadows, it's taken, you know, more than two years for the Justice Department to do that. And I understand there's a congressional investigation going on and the like, and you don't want wires to be crossed. But um, we've lost a lot of valuable time on something that's so central to our democracy. And, you know, thank heavens for people like the secretary um, who, you know, bravely stood up and, and did the right thing. And the Secretary of State in Georgia, Rafsenberger, as you said, did the right thing when it really mattered. Um, I mean, it's one of the interesting things about Trump world is that, you know, people would just laugh and laugh off Trump. You'd be like, oh, yeah, he's denigrating Muslims or he's, you know, blowing up climate or something like that. But nobody ever felt responsible to stop that. And when it came time for Rafsenberger to do the, to make the call, he made the right call. When it came time for have been amazing to me, Mike Pence, to make the right call on January 6th, thanks to the thanks to the advice of Judge Michael Ludig. Uh, you know, Pence did the right thing. For once in his life, he was that broken clock that was actually right, and he stood up and did the right thing. Um, otherwise, democracy would have gone entirely off the rails. And that, to me, is kind of why the Justice Department should have been investigating this full throttle from the first minute that this happened, you know, while this was still the Trump administration back January 6th and 7th, mm -hmm. because, you know, this is like, you know, it can't just be that because of a couple of in brave individuals, um, you know, crisis was averted. We can't have this happen again and rely on uh, the officials to all do the right thing, you know. And so the prosecution and the, you know, getting to the bottom of what happened is so, so incredibly important.